Good evening. Good to see you this evening. We're going to open our service with number 458, Gentle Shepherd. think of your name in just a minute. <laughs> Jim Connolly, open us in prayer. <laughs> thank you, Heavenly Father, uh, for this and other uh, Lord's Day. Uh, thank you for this opportunity that we had to gather here this evening to feed upon your word. We thank you so much, Father, for 
all the blessings that you give us. Uh, we thank you, Father, for America, for allowing us to live in a land where that we can worship you according to your will. Pray you bless uh, Dennis this evening as he brings the message, and I pray that each one of us here this evening will uh, store up your word in our heart and we'll not be able to share it with others. If there are any among us that are outside of Christ, I pray, Father, they'll see the need and become obedient to the gospel. We're so thankful for Sandy that was baptized this morning. Help us, Father, to be an example for her and others. Uh, be with you in heaven someday. Please forgive us, Father, when we come up short. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Number 461 will be our next hymn of praise. First and last verse of it as well. Good evening, folks. Good evening. We're not quite as fast as we used to be, are we? In the uh, way of announcements, uh, elders and deacons meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m. And at the same time, the women in action will be having their meeting, uh, both over in the GBI building. Uh, bean supper, August the 25th, immediately following evening services over in the GBI building. A couple revivals, uh, Oak, I mean, Crossview Church of Christ uh, will be the 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, Mike Bridenball will be the speaker, and that meeting will start at 7 o'clock in the evening. Also, Macedonia will be having their uh, revival September the 16th through the 20th, 7 o'clock nightly. And Kevin Whitsett will be the speaker there. Also up at Crossview on the 18th is their homecoming. So if you'd like to go share with them on their homecoming, that will be great. It is uh, September or August the 18th. September the 14th, they are having a picture day. Uh, we had it uh, a couple times in the past uh, over in the GBI building, the whole congregation. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer at the time you would like to be there. So uh, they're trying to get all this together for our homecoming. So just to visit the sign-up sheet and put your name on there of what time you would like to go over and uh, uh, get your picture taken. 
uh, something else. Oh, yes. If you have any pictures you would like to share with the committee on the history of the Grundy Church of Christ, please have them in by the 14th of September also. Are there other announcements? Jesus is coming. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Amen. Yes. In the way of a prayer request, uh, continue to remember uh, Pam Fleming and uh, Bobby Hill, uh, Kathy Kennedy, and uh, Dennis Scarberry, uh, Martha Church, Gay, and David Harden. I know there are many, many more that uh, really, really need our prayers, and a lot of you know some that I don't. But if you. What was the name again? Betty Young. Betty Young. Uh, she has been on our cancer list for quite some time. And uh, there are many, many other cancer patients out there. And we have a long list. We go over the list each Wednesday night, person by person. And we update as needed. Uh, and uh, we give God the thanks for those that we're able to take off our list that are doing well now. So please come out on Wednesday night and join us uh, in the Bible study and, uh, and our prayer list. Any other urgent prayer requests uh, at this time? Update on Easton. He is actually on his way home now. He should be home any time. Oh, very good. Yes, very good. I talked to him just a little while ago and he was in agony. I didn't actually talk to Easton. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you for prayers on uh, Samantha and the Lee family. Uh, Easton is on his way home, so he will be home shortly. He really is getting stronger. Right? Yes, he is. Yeah. yeah. Answered prayers. Thank you, Lord. Any other urgent prayer requests? Sympathy expressions. I had the families of Christine Justice. Gladys Daniels, Everett Justice, Maxie Mitchell, Homer Blankenship, Brenda Justice, and Sherry Ramey. Anyone else? If not, our prayer hymn was number 435. After the last verse, uh, Gary Jude, could I get you a hair prayer, please, please? Thank you. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear.
service and worship the Lord as we together here again in your house this afternoon. Father, our hearts are heavy with the names that we've talked about and the many that we know, God, has suffered so many on the list. I don't know them all, but I know that you do. Many, Lord, it's, uh, in the hospitals and uh, some at home, Lord, being cared for. We pray for the afflicted, Lord, and we pray for those that care, watch over. Somebody's bed in a state like this, and I just pray God that you bless her and bless them, Lord, as they together around her. Shirley, uh, still down there, Shirley Stacy, God, has been there for a while. I pray, Lord, that you bless her, God, and give her him. She's had many trials with this uh, long problems, and I pray, God, that you give her him. Help her, God, she can come home. God, in any way we fail, so we ask all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. I know that's you, but this has been a good day in the Lord, hasn't it? Amen. A precious soul has been saved. Amen. Number 364 will be our communion hymn tonight. Reading from the 26th chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And blessed and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day, when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Every Lord's Day for the Christian ought to excite us. An opportunity to come around this table to remember that price that he paid for our sins. Make it personal, folks. He took your sin. He took your payment of sin on himself. He paid a debt of sin you and I can never pay. And all he asks of us to do is to come around this table. Remove the worldly thoughts out of our mind and center our minds on Calvary. What happened to him? The beatings that he endured. They made fun of him. They spit in his face. They said, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And he took all of that because he loved you. Don't forget that love. Don't forget that compassion Jesus had. He could have called 10,000 angels to come down and rescue him. But he didn't do it. He stayed on that cross because he loved you so much. Let's remember that tonight around this table. If you have not had the opportunity to be around the table this morning, Make your way down here to the front, and the men would dare to serve you as we sing.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these two that have come in obedience to your word to be around the Lord's table together. And we know, Heavenly Father, that it's easy for all of us sometimes to get things on our mind and worry and wonder. But I just pray, Heavenly Father, just now that you will help each one of us to put all of that out of our mind, as John said earlier. And just let us focus upon the Lord as he hang on the cross. We know that he died for each one of us. We also know, Heavenly Father, that salvation comes through him only. So we just thank you, Heavenly Father, uh, that we can partake in this uh, loaf that represents his body and this cup represents his sinless blood for each one of us. Help us to be mindful. No one ever loved us like Jesus loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. sing this last stanza as these take their seats. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. You stop and think about that. How we give gifts to our loved ones at birthday time, Christmas time. But you know something? God gave us the best gift of all. The greatest gift of all was given. And that was his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight as you give, you get to give somebody an opportunity to obey this word. Because folks, when you give into the kingdom of God, you're telling the world that you are a Christian and a Christian only. And you're standing with Joshua of old and you're proclaiming to the world, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Think of that as you get tonight. Merciful Father, thank you for this day, God. I always thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Father. And Father, as we think about a gift, we usually only give gifts to the ones we love. And Father, we so love your son Jesus and you. So I pray tonight as... People give that they give with a loving heart, a cheerful heart, knowing that how dark the world would be if it wasn't for your son, Jesus Christ. What turmoil we'd be in if it wasn't for your son. And how his love spreads through our life every day. Thank you so much for each and everything that you do for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we ask these blessings. Amen. Thank you, Ann Lee. <clears throat> well, 
we've said this many, many times. We certainly appreciate uh, our uh, pianist and organist and uh, all of those that uh, do what they can for the Lord. Uh, you're, you're much appreciated, and uh, we uh, seriously miss you when you're not here. So uh, thank you again. Uh, this evening, we're going to uh, continue uh, with the thoughts that we began last Sunday morning, uh, being a sample of Christianity and being a good example. Uh, all of those go hand in hand uh, in our daily lives. Uh, and we want to stress that daily part. Uh, Christianity isn't just about a meeting together on Sunday uh, for an hour or two hours. Uh, Christianity involves our entire life, and we've got to be more and more aware of that all the time as we grow and mature as Christians uh, we need to learn that our life is being an example uh, to someone and that needs to be an example that's a positive example uh, so that people will be influenced uh, by our lives uh, our, uh, the close of our service this morning we were talking about uh, Hebrews 20, uh, 10 25 not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as we see the day approaching. And we was talking about uh, the importance of worshiping God. Uh, we have uh, all week to serve Him, uh, but the first day of the week is when we come together to worship collectively, and we worship individually as well. Uh, every person that has come, uh, we've come together as a group to worship God. Uh, but we're here as an individual to worship God. Uh, and it's on our part. Uh, the feelings that we have and the emotions that we have towards our Heavenly Father, that's our worship. Uh, so we've, we've got to honor and respect uh, God in our worship. Uh, and it's got to be according to His Word. We've got to worship the way that His Word instructs us. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, our spirit is our inner being, our living part. Uh, our body, uh, our spirit is in our body, our so naturally, our body is here to worship, but it's in our spirit. It's in our mind and our understanding. It's in our intellect that we really show homage to God. It isn't by the motions of our body. Uh, it is by the knowledge that's in our mind that we show respect and honor to Him uh, while we're here in that worship. So since God is a spirit, uh, He's not here in a physical body, so we're worshiping Him in spirit. Now, how important is the doctrine? That's what we were talking about when we were talking about the importance of worship. How important is the doctrine? Uh, we certainly wouldn't teach or believe that studying the Scriptures is not important. Uh, whenever the Bible is filled with examples of our, the necessity for us to know the Word of God. Uh, so, first of all, we're going to look at 2 Timothy 2.15. The Bible says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So as we study, uh, there's a lot of difference between studying and reading. Uh, there's a lot of difference between study and meditating, thinking on God's word. Uh, study is digging into God's word and uh, finding those things there that uh, just on the surface may be hidden. Uh, and when you study uh, uh, any particular subject uh, within the Word of God, your knowledge is going to increase. And when your knowledge increases, your faith is going to increase, your trust in God is going to increase, your hope in heaven is going to increase, because Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, so at that time... Uh, when those words were written, in order to hear the word of God, you had to hear one of the apostles or someone that had taught them. You had to hear them preach. But now we have it written. So we can study the written word and increase our faith, can't we? This means yes. Just seeing if you're paying attention. So uh, we certainly wouldn't teach uh, that it's not important to study the word of God. 
And there's many, many scriptures that we could cover. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, the scripture says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So we get it from God. And it tells us what the scriptures are given to us for. It's profitable for doctrine, teaching, reproof, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So God's word is given to us for our benefit. Uh, this isn't for God's benefit. Uh, the word is given to us for our own benefit so that we can correct ourselves, so that we can chastise ourselves, so we can rebuke ourselves, and where we can help others. So it is through the word of God that we grow spiritually in the Lord. Uh, now the book of Ephesians tells us that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. So when we study the word, we're growing in Christ and we receive spiritual blessings, don't we? Uh, in our lives. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul says this to the young preacher Timothy. As Timothy is the evangelist that uh, Paul is going to leave behind to uh, pick up and do some of the work that Paul was going to heaven and going to leave behind, uh, Paul instructs Timothy here, I charge you therefore before God. Now, it would have been strong enough if Paul said, I command you or I charge you to just preach the gospel. But Paul goes a little bit farther here and he says, I charge you before the Lord. Now, that's pretty serious, isn't it? Paul said, I charge you before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, to preach the word. Now, in our lives as a Christian, it's, this is not just written to the evangelist. All of us as, as Christians, when we go out into the world, we need to declare the word. That word preach just means to declare. We need to declare the word of God in words, but more importantly, we need to declare the word of God in our actions. And in our conduct, that's why James said, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So uh, Paul is telling the young preacher here, Timothy, to preach the word and to be instant in season, out of season, and reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Again, that word doctrine comes up. The teaching of God's word. So the teaching of God's word is for rebuking, uh, setting things straight and setting things in order, and that's the duty of the evangelist, uh, and whether it's in season or out of season. And sometimes we misunderstood, misunderstand uh, that phrase there, in season and out of season. In season is a scheduled time to gather together and worship. That's in season. We have a time set aside to gather on Sunday morning. Uh, we have a time set aside at 10 o'clock to have Sunday school. We have a time at 11 o'clock to set aside as our Sunday morning worship. We have 6 in the evening on Sunday evening to have Sunday evening service. We have Wednesday night set aside at 6 p.m. Uh, for Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting. That is in-season times. The evangelist is to be prepared for that time. We know ahead of time that we're going to be teaching and preaching on the Word of God at those scheduled times in season. But there's times that are out of season. There's times that we need to teach on certain things uh, whenever it's not a scheduled time. You may run into someone on the street or somebody might give you a phone call and ask you a question about the Scriptures. So you've got to be instant, ready at all times, whether it's in season or out of season, to... Reprove, rebuke, and very, very importantly, to exhort. Now, what does that word exhort mean? What does it mean to exhort? To encourage or lift up, right? How many times do we have an opportunity as Christians to exhort a fellow brother or sister in the Lord? Uh, a big part of my ministry is in exhortation. Uh, talking to people that are going through hardships in their life and encouraging them and telling them that things is going to be better. The Lord understands our problems. Uh, this sickness is just temporary. 
the doctor is going to be able to do a lot to relieve your pain. And besides that, the Lord can add healing and his blessings to it. We're all time lifting up and exhorting one another. And the scripture says here that we need to be instant, in season and out of season at all times. We need to be ready to encourage people in the Lord. And then verse 4 it says, for the time will come. Now, this is a very serious warning that Paul is giving to Timothy to pass along to all those that hear him. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There's going to come a time, Paul said, that people are not going to listen to the truth of God's Word. Do you think that applies to us today? Do you think that applies to our society? Do you think that applies to the church sometimes? Yes, even to the church, this certainly applies. There will come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, their own passions, their own desires, their own feelings, their own judgments, their own emotions, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, the doctrine in God's word, and shall be turned unto fables. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Endure problems and hardships. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. So all of us, as we go out into the world, we've got to endure some things. Sometimes it's problems within our physical bodies that we have to endure. Sometimes it's problems in the lives of people around us. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's children. Sometimes it's parents. Uh, We have to endure those hardships and make full proof of our ministry so that people that is watching our lives can see there's a reality in serving God as a true and living God. People can see that in our lives. Now, as we continue to think about that, what do we teach by our example? When people look at our lives, when we face a problem, regardless of what that problem is, and people see how we handle that problem in our lives, what kind of example are we being to them? Do we ever get to the point in our lives when we run up on a problem that we can't handle, that people see our life in chaos and sees us as a person that is helpless and a person that is hopeless? Hopefully, no one will ever see us at the point in our lives that we're without help and we're without hope because there's always hope in the Lord, isn't there? And there's always help in the Lord. David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So regardless of what kind of situation we get in in life, people ought to be able to see in our lives that our trust is not in the arm of flesh, but it's in the arm of God. That's why David said, my hope and my help is in a rock that is higher than I. Man, isn't that good to think of? Isn't it good to know that whenever we're down, whenever we're hurting, that there's someone that cares about us and someone that can change the situation that we're in? And at the very last, God can deliver us out of this entire world and out of this body and take us to a place where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more worry or tears. Uh, We have that everlasting hope, right? So uh, our example, what kind of example are we being? We need to be an example that people never sees us helpless or hopeless. Would we ever teach uh, for doctrine, for truth from God's word, that it is impossible to fall in our relationship with God? Now, in the religious world, that is being taught. And we need to constantly remind one another that we need to be faithful until death, and then we'll receive the crown of life, according to Revelation 2.10. James said, uh, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, because after he's tried, then he'll receive the prize, or he'll receive the crown of life. So it is in our problems and in our trials that we need to remain faithful. And people observe that, and they see our faithfulness, and they see our dependence and our trust on the Lord and our trust in his word. And that is an example to them whenever they get into a problem that they can't handle, 
well, I could be dealing with this much better if I had the Lord in my life. So that's an area in our lives that we can help people that are outside of Christ to the point that you don't even have to say a word to them. They can see that your life is not just chaos when you run into something that you can't handle. Our trust is in the Lord, and the Lord continues to direct us in a straight path. And people can see that in your life. You aren't just going around in circles all the time, but you're still making progress in the Lord and in His work. Yet there are people who live any way they want to, live fulfilling the desires of the flesh, uh, live fulfilling the desires of the mind, uh, and I guess you could say that they want to uh, be right at the foot of the cross. And that's a proverbial saying that we use sometimes to show closeness to the Lord. Uh, they want to be at the foot of the cross on Sunday morning. Uh, but the rest of the week, they want to be as far away from the cross as they can get. Uh, and that mentality shows us that their heart is not really in the Lord their heart is in their own flesh and satisfying their own desires. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And every one of us needs to go over that verse in our mind every single day. As a Christian, as someone who thinks of themselves as being a faithful Christian and being a good Christian, we need to be reminded every day that we need to take heed. We need to pay attention to the teaching of God's Word, lest we also fall. So, do you think God would put a warning in His Word if there was no danger of us falling? I, I don't think God would waste our time and waste His time and waste the time of the apostles and waste the Holy Spirit's time of putting things into the Word of God uh, if they didn't even exist. So there is a danger of us falling from grace. As a matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul said to those that had turned from Christianity back to the Jewish religion, Paul said, you have already fallen from grace. And yet I hear people in the religious world today say that you can't fall from grace. But they already had, and their scripture warns over and over that we can. So we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling every day of our lives. That fear and trembling is honor and respect towards God and His authority and being in submission to His Word and obeying Him. Now, the Bible teaches us that we should live as far away from the world as we possibly can. A long time ago... Uh, John Butler Book, the grandfather of the John Book that we know, John Butler Book uh, made a statement, and he's been quoted, and been quoted, and this is probably 150 years since he made uh, this statement. It's a good thing for the boat to be in the water. That's a natural place for the boat to be, isn't it? Uh, it's not natural for the boat to be out here on dry ground. So it's a natural thing for the boat to be in the water. It's a good thing for the boat to be in the water, but it's a bad thing for water to be in the boat, right? What happens when water gets in the boat? So whenever the church is in the world, it's a good thing, isn't it? That's what Jesus commanded the church to do. Go into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But whenever the world starts getting into the church, what happens? It begins to sink, right? Just like the boat. So the church needs to be separated from the world. The church is different. We talked about that in our Sunday school lesson this morning. We are different from the world. And we're called to be separate from the world. And to be distinct from the world. And our hopes and our expectations, our lifestyle, everything is different from that that is in the world. So whenever we allow things in the world to come into the church, then we are falling into a trap that the devil has set. 
whenever we are trying to be like the world to attract people in the world, then the world, we're not having an impact on the world. The world's having an impact on us, right? Because the scripture, God has called us out to be separate from the world and different from the world. And when we begin to go back and do things that are worldly to attract people in the world, do you think that's going to work? No. They're drawing us back, right? Whenever we begin to do the things that the world is doing, and we begin to practice things and have them as a part of worship services or whatever, and that's a part of the world, then we're being attracted by the world. Now, I don't know how many of you all have seen this, but there is a congregation down in Florida uh, that is having happy hour uh, an hour before church service. And they are selling alcoholic beverages. In the, they've got a big uh, foyer out in front of the church building, out in front of the sanctuary. And they have TVs. It's set up just like a sports bar. And they sell alcoholic beverages. And they invite everybody to come and have a drink. Uh, but they don't allow any drinks into the sanctuary part. But they want everybody to come and enjoy themselves and loosen up before church service and then come into a church service. Now, folks, I'm not trying to be judgmental or harsh. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm no better than anybody else on this planet. But whenever the world begins to have an effect on us, that we're doing worldly things to attract people to the church, the very opposite of what we think we're accomplishing is happening. We are going back into the world. Now, that is a serious, serious mistake that's happening on different scales all around us. Whenever we veer away from the Scriptures and we begin to do things that's not pleasing or acceptable to God, then we are allowing the world to have an impact on us and we're losing our impact on the world. That's why it's so important that we've got to be different. Galatians 5.4, uh, Christ, Paul said this, Christ has become of no effect to you. Now let that statement sink in just a little bit before we finish this. We've already quoted the end of it. But Paul said, that Christ has become of no effect to you. Does that scare you at all? Does that bother you to think that in my own personal life that I can get to the point that Christ and His Word doesn't have any effect on me? Sometimes we stand behind the pulpit and we preach a lesson and we try to give as graphic a detail as we can muster in our minds about the crucifixion and what Jesus endured. And hardly ever will you see a tear in anyone's eyes. No one is moved emotionally. It's an old, old story that's just become an old, old story. And whenever it gets to the point that Christ doesn't have any effect on us, you know what's happening in our lives? Our heart has become hardened to the Word of God and we've become so familiar with it that it doesn't have any impact on us. Man, that's serious, isn't it? I want God's Word to reach my heart just like it reached those on the day of Pentecost. Whenever the Scripture says it pricked them in the heart. Now these people were people that had been present when Jesus was crucified. Some of those same people were people that cried out, Away with him, crucify him, release Barabbas. And they were there when Jesus was crucified. And they saw what happened. They saw the darkness. They felt the earthquake. They saw the rocks broke open. They saw the veil of the temple rent from the top to the bottom. And they heard the Roman soldier cry out, Surely this was the Son of God. And Dr. Luke records these words. And they smote their breast and went away. They realized that they had been guilty in crucifying the Son of God. Amen. And they smote their breast and they went away. And the day of Pentecost came. 
And Peter begins to preach. And Peter places the blame square on those people's shoulders. He said, let the whole house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus that you crucified. God has made him both Lord and Christ. They were cut to the heart. This message really had an impact on them. They felt it. They knew that they were guilty of killing the Son of God. What worse crime could be committed than killing God's Son? And they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get rid of the guilt of killing God's Son? And Peter told them to repent and be baptized. Their sins would be washed away. They'd receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God would add them to his kingdom. They would now be back in a covenant relationship with God. So, folks, it's very, very important that the Word of God touches our lives. It's meant to touch our lives. It's meant to cut our hearts. It's meant to change the direction of our lives. It's meant to direct us in the right path. And whenever we get to the point that God's Word doesn't have an effect on us, we are on serious, serious ground. Paul says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. Now, Paul was talking to a group of Christian people just like those that are assembled here tonight. And... Those that taught the Jewish faith had come in to the church and they had begun to teach these new Christians that in order for you to have a right relationship with God, you have to go back and you have to observe the Old Testament law. Now, the Old Testament law was a law in the flesh, right? Thou shalt not kill. And until you actually killed someone, you were not guilty of murder. But Jesus changed that law and he said if you hate your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder already. To be guilty of adultery, you had to be caught in the act, and you had to actually commit the act in the flesh, uh, and you were put to death without mercy. But Jesus said you can think about it in your mind, and you can commit adultery and never touch another person. You can do it in your mind. So we see here that we have to be justified by obedience to the word and not justified by the law. We can justify a lot of things by the law and say that we're not guilty. You remember studying the scriptures about Jesus' life in the gospels where a young man came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. What good thing do I still lack in order to have eternal life? He justified himself by the law. Many times in our daily lives as Christians, we try to justify ourselves by the legality of the law. You know, I haven't killed anyone. I haven't committed adultery. A lot of other things I haven't done that I could say that I haven't done. But whenever the Lord looks at our lives, is there faults in our lives? Are there problems in our lives that we need to work out and fix and get right with the Lord? Yes. So uh, we cannot legally justify ourselves by the flesh and obedience to the laws of God in the Old Testament or the laws of the land. Certainly we need to obey those laws. But we're justified by our faith, right? And our obedience to God. And he said, those of you that are trying to justify yourself and say that we have not made mistakes in our spiritual lives, then you've already fallen from grace. You've fallen away from the Lord because you're trusting in the arm of the flesh rather than in God. Now, the scripture teaches us, the Bible teaches us that we should live as far away from the world as we possibly can. Now, when we're living away from the world... We're being separated from the world, and yet the Lord instructs us to go out into the world. That's why we use the illustration of the boat. It's a good thing for the boat to be out on the water, but whenever the water gets in the boat, it's a bad thing. Now, in our Christian lives, we're to be out in the world, 
And we're to be proclaiming Christ as we go into the world. But we must not allow the world to have an effect on our Christianity or on our relationship with God. Now, the Bible says this. We quoted this verse this morning, and I encourage all of you to remember Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul is writing to these Roman Christians. And Paul said, I beseech you, I beg you, I command you, I urge you. It's, it's very important that you pay attention to this. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto God. It don't have to please everybody else, but the life that we're living has got to be holy and it's got to be acceptable unto God because it's our reasonable service. And Paul said, and be not conformed to this world. But be transformed. Now, what does the word transform mean? That's the word that we get in the original language is metamorpho, and we get the word metamorphosis. That's what takes place when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. That is changing a complete state. A caterpillar is a little animal that crawls around here on the earth and gnaws and gums around on the leaves and everything. And whenever it... Uh, crawls into a cocoon and goes through metamorphosis, goes through a change. No longer is it conformed to this world. No longer is it in contact with this world. No longer is it dependent upon uh, crawling around and gnawing on leaves. But it goes through a metamorphosis, and when it comes out of that cocoon, it's a beautiful butterfly. And its whole practice completely changes. Instead of crawling around and inching its way along, it takes to the air and flies. Instead of eating and gnawing on leaves, what does it do? It has those little receptors that goes into the flowers and it sips out the nectar, the sweetness that God has created within the flowers. So just as sure as a caterpillar goes through metamorphosis and becomes a butterfly. When we uh, change from a creature of sin into a creature of righteousness, there ought to be a metamorphosis that takes place in our lives. We're a different creature. We no longer are gomming around and partaking of things in the world and gomming around in this world, but we're uh, sipping the nectar of God's goodness and His grace and His mercy. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And Paul said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Now, how are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind. It's the way that we think. It's our thought process. And the more that we know about God's Word, the more faith we have. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more that we know about the Word of God, the more that we're transformed, the more faith that we have, the more trust that we have in God, and our life becomes completely different. Now, the Apostle John, the beloved Apostle John, John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, he says, love not the world. Don't love the world. Don't love what's going on in the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, everything that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, is not is not, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is going to pass away, and the lust of it, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. The world and all the works that are in the world, all the things that man has called joy and pleasure and luxury are all going to pass away. But the things of God is going to endure forever. The sample of Christianity that we portray to the world can either be a stumbling block or a stepping stone. I want to close tonight with a few lines that I found from a, a little poem. I don't know who the author was, but it goes like this. You write a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. 
Men read what you write. However faithless or however true. Tell me, what is the gospel according to you? What does the world see in the gospel that we're writing with our lives every day? I want to leave you with a challenge tonight. Would everyone accept a challenge to do something good, just a random act of kindness, a deed of kindness, for someone every day this week? Take, take that challenge and see if it affects you, see if it changes you, the way that you feel about your daily life. Now, you know the Boy Scouts are always uh, uh, recognized for helping a little old lady across the street. Do, do a deed of kindness every day this week. And when you, before you leave the house of the morning, uh, just think in your own mind, I'm going to do something good for somebody today. And don't tell anybody about it. Just do it. And the Lord will see it. The Lord will reward you. We don't have to come back next Sunday and brag about what we've done. Just begin to do that and allow that to be a daily practice in your life that you do something good for someone every day. And it'll change the way that you feel about people. And you'll see a lot of needs that we have just overlooked and we've passed by. If we look for an opportunity then that opportunity will present itself before us. That's why the Apostle Paul said in the Galatian letter, as we have therefore opportunity, let's do good unto all men, but especially those in the household of faith. So when we look for opportunities to do good, opportunities to be witnesses, the Lord, I really believe, opens doors. The Apostle Paul prayed for that, didn't he? That he'd open doors or give opportunities to them in their ministry. We need to ask God for opportunities in our daily lives to be a help to someone so that we can influence them for Christ. Don't just pray for opportunities so that we can pat ourselves on the back and tell somebody else how good we've been this week. But let's pray for opportunities to be an effective witness to them to show them that there is a reality in serving God as a true and living God. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a Christian, we want to invite you to come and give your life to the Lord and experience something that you've never experienced, uh, being outside of Christ. Uh, having the burden lifted of knowing that you're in sin, uh, that you might be lost forever in a place called hell, all of that burden is released from you and you have a feeling that you can't describe until you experience it yourself. So tonight, we want to invite you to come believing that Jesus is the Christ. Confess Him before this audience, repent of your sins, and be baptized. And God will intervene, wash your sins away, add you to His family, record your name in the book of life, set you on a path towards heaven. All of that's good, isn't it? So if you need to do that, we're going to invite you to come as we stand and sing our invitation hymn. For Jesus I long picture. I've seen some beautiful snows and sometimes they're cold and wind blowing and, uh, but there's sometimes that the snow falls so gently and it's beautiful and white. Big old flakes of snow and it's just a beautiful thought. Uh, but to think that God can take our life that is filled with sin and dark as can be and he can cleanse it and make it white as that pure 
pleasant, soft snow. That's a wonderful feeling to experience in our lives. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I pray that uh, your word continues to have an effect on our lives and that we'll never lose our fear and respect for you as being the almighty God. That we'll always stand in awe of you and we'll respect you and we'll honor you for not only your power and your might and your judgment, but God, we would honor you because of your love that you had for us. And help us to live every day to show that love to you by the way that we conduct our lives in obedience to your word, by the way that we interact with the people that we come in contact with every day, with our brothers and sisters, uh, with those that are still out in the world. God, help us to be a good sample. Help us to be a good example of what you want us to be, that we might bring glory and honor to you and that we might draw people into your service. Help us to support and encourage one another to keep pressing forward every day until that day comes that we depart this life or your son comes back and we can fly away and leave this world behind and we can be forever with you. Thank you for that hope. Let us rest and be comforted in our faith and in our obedience to your word. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.